Greg McRae was drafted from Glenelg in South Australia with pick 22 in the 1994 National Draft to the Brisbane Lions and would go on to play 195 games, 232 goals, winning three consecutive premierships, 2001, 2002 and 2003, and what many believe to be one of the greatest teams in VFL, AFL history. A teacher by trade, four years primary teaching experience, Fly, as he is universally known, embarked on an 18-year coaching apprenticeship before being appointed as the head coach of the Collingwood Football Club before the start of the 2022 season. He was awarded the AFL Coaches Association Coach of the Year in his first season, falling one point short of making the grand final in that first year. On the 30th of September 2023, Craig McRae coached Collingwood to an incredible four-point win over the team he played for, the Brisbane Lions, delivering the Magpies its 16th Premiership and first since 2010. Fly, great to see you. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks to us. Good to be here. Big smile on your face. Uh, still, can I it's start? still fresh. The paint's still wet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's joyful being in your in your presence. Can I just start with a nickname? Where, who, where did Fly come from and wh- what's the backstory on that? Yeah, it's uh, something I've been trying to shake for 30-odd years now. We uh, When I grew up in Adelaide, I was playing at Glenelg. You know, Choco Williams coached me uh, as a young fella down at Glenelg and um, – yeah, he took us to the movies one day for a, you know, a bit of a bonding session and, and it was Back to the Future. It just came out and I think it was George or Marty McFly. I had a similar haircut and, with a, and it looked very much like him. So the boys started calling me McFly and I couldn't shake it. And then over over the time, it's just sort of dropped the Mac and become Fly. And I, and I must admit, I'd, I've gone to 25, 30 years now and I tried to rec- reclaim Craig for a while, but even that's not a great name. So I've just, uh, something that's stuck by me. And as you know, in footy clubs, the harder you try, yeah. the more things stick. A lot of people won't remember Back to the Future, cult film back in yeah, that era, yeah, and it, yeah. it really took over the world. Marty McFly. So yeah, that's it, yeah. Fly's it for, and it came yeah. to Brisbane with you. Yeah, it came, it came there, and yeah, even uh, even my younger daughter calls me Fly sometimes. <laughs> and it's, it's evolved in different, you have to fly bags, a few other things. Mick Malthouse named me Fly Bags once, and so it's, it's evolved, <laughs> but I'd, yeah, anyway, here we are. We're fresh from grand final day. Your wife, uh, Gabrielle was due on that day, and you, and you knew weeks out yeah. there was a possibility. Incredibly, seven forty-five a.m. on what's the, one of the biggest days of your life. Your third daughter Maggie is born. The heart must have been pumping yeah. that morning. Can you tell us how it all unfolded? Well, you know, when we were lucky enough to find out that we're having a, a child, and and yeah, that's it's joyful and it's exciting. And then they tell us the due date, and I was sort of just flicking through my phone and going, oh, "Hang on a minute, that that thirtieth of September that." That's grand final day. And then we sort of laughed and, and didn't think much of it. And then as, as the year goes on, we're going, oh, well, there's a fair bit that has to you know, align here for this to happen. Um, you know, baby being born on the due date, but also us making the grand final. And I said, oh, we just kept putting it off. Let's not worry about it. You know, let's qualify first. You know, then we qualify finals and don't worry about it. We're going to make a prelim before we even worry about that. And, and before we know it, here we are, you know, a week out, made a grand final. And my w- wife's about to be 40 weeks pregnant on the day. And, um, but even still the obstetrician was saying it's probably going to be a week late, maybe a little bit more. So in my mind, we, no problems at all. We'll go, go and do the grand final and, and worry about it when we have to. Um, little did I know that she sort of started to go in labor on the parade. She was in the, in the car in front of us or in, in, in the car that was at the back and, um, went into labor, but kept it to herself. You know, just, I, my wife's pretty amazing, but this is next level. And then, cause her sister was down they end up going to the hospital together at midnight. It was full, full contractions, labor and- Unbeknownst to you? I had no idea. I went to bed with our other daughter and um, had no idea. And then wake up about quarter to six, her mum's rang and said, uh, you better take this call. And my wife says, oh, you better get it. The baby's going to be born about half an hour. And where William's down to St. Vincent's, there's a bit of a drive. And I just, in a mad rush, went there. An hour later, the most joyful experience that you will ha- ever have as being a father and uh, little Maggie was born. And that leads into this dream of coaching an AFL grand final. I mean, you're the most relaxed person I think I've seen and you, the, the smile and the joy. Was that, did that throw you out at all or were you just like, this is meant to be? And No, look, I, I just know that match day is about playing. Like we set it up like that every week for our players. It's, you know, match day's the outcome and, and you know, you've done all the process. So I knew that everything had been put in place. There was no disruption to any of that. I was really well planned for the match day meeting, a bit of fun and as I normally do, I had it all set out. But the only thing that sort of threw me is that I, in my madness and the darkness, I've grabbed all my work gear thinking I better go from there to the game because I don't know how long this is going to take. Yeah. 
I grabbed two right shoes <laughs> <laughs> in the darkness, and I. So it wasn't until about half past eleven. I think I better get ready for this game here. We we got to we got to get to the ground, and um, I've gone to put my shoes on. I'm going, oh no! So then then straight away I've had to go into autopilot. Yeah, you know, as your coach, you just look for solutions, not about the problem, and worked away trying to work through that. But I end up running to pick up some shoes on the way, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just it's the joy and the and the moment of having a child. It's it's so special, and then to actually then be able to put that into place and then go to work. It yeah, you know, I just. Uh, is this, is all this? Just find a way. Come back to the to the day a little bit later. But for me, you, you've brought this great joy to the sport that we love, and the smile, and the charm, and the and the good humour that you've had uh, since you've been in the main chair. Can you take us inside? I understand pre-game that every time we see vision of the, the rooms inside, the players are pissing themselves laughing. Yep. You're laughing. Can you share with us some of the ways that you've approached that, and why you chose that path? Oh, uh, well, I think my personality is cheeky. I like to be cheeky but respectful and, um, you know, I don't like to be disrespectful, opposition or, you know, whatever it looks like, people. Um, but I like being cheeky. I like having a laugh and I think, <laughs> you know, life, life is too short not to. So my personality does come out in my coaching. Um, but particularly match day, this group have sort of taught me what they need. You know, like you sort of inherit a group and you wonder what, what gets the best out of them. And in the early days when I was presenting for a game, um, I went a little bit light. I told a story about, you know, I was trying to sell my car and whatever and a few funny bits about it. And and it got this relaxed nature because the week before I sensed the tension in the group and whether it was a performance anxiety, I'm not sure, but you sort of work out what your group needs. So it started to evolve from that. And then, you know, last year in particular, we just took it on different journeys and find different ways to get a laugh, to, to relax the room um, and allow, allow the oxygen to breathe in the brain to then let some stuff go. So um, there was an evolution of it, but it became a, you know, important part of match day routine was relaxed into, into, you know, mindset, you know, where do we need to go into performance? Um, and then, yeah, nothing's changed in that time. It's just, you know, whether it's a video of, um, you know, Geordie, Geordie to go running on the ground and, and mirroring that to a, um, a Forrest Gump movie, like I just said, that was match day grand final. That was grand final day. Yeah. Yeah. The, I don't know if you remember the prelim, he's on the bench, he runs on, he's got high knees and he runs... <laughs> It seems like I went forever in running, so I put that into like, and one day I started running, and <laughs> and then you're just looking for little angles to to have fun. Um, but ultimately, you can't have fun unless you've done the work. And this group is one of the best I've ever seen at preparing, training standards, you know, preparing to play, trying to get better every day. So then you rock into match day, and and you know you've done the work. And and it's hard to be relaxed if you haven't. Is there a famous one from the prelim final of the year before? Am I told that uh, there might have been a whole heap of confetti emerge out of your rooms? Yeah, that, that, was, yeah, that was that was probably a couple of weeks before then. It might have been a qualifying final. Okay. Yeah, we celebrated Darcy Cameron's fortieth game one, <laughs> one week, which no one's ever done in the history of the game, but we decided to. And uh, he's a pretty soft target, Darcy. He's, he's easy to find a laugh for. Um, for. Um, but we had Gil McLaughlin send a video message in about. Yeah, how important it is to play forty games, and and uh, and then I think we got a message from Warwick Kappa too because Darcy Cameron played one game for Sydney, and yeah, you know, how, how he was a legend and Darcy's not. You know, all these, and Fraser Garrick because he called himself the G Train. Fraser Garrick did a video message about imitating him and things. So that it it just grows. You know, the length you go to to do it sometimes it's is right in front of your face. Other times you have to search for it. But again, allowing the players to be relaxed to perform is something that was important for this group. And speaking of which, and I, I've said this to you before, my favourite moment for the year happened on Anzac Day with your team and sitting there, lucky enough to be in the best seat in the house calling the game, Braden Maynard kicks out from full back and literally misses the ball. It rolls off his shin, rolls into his opponent's lap. He kicks it straight over his head and kicks a goal. You can't have a bigger clanger in sport than that. Anzac Day is 100,000, one of the most significant days outside of grand final day, and they pan to the bench, and there's you <laughs> pissing yourself laughing. And I couldn't help but the joy that gave me because I know in the past we just played in an era where you might have got dragged, you definitely would have abused, the runner would have come out and, you know, called you everything under the sun. And, and we all knew how unhelpful that was. But how have you been able to train the players to just yeah. relax in that moment? Oh, it's been consistent messaging around, you know, whether it's a windscreen wiper analogy that, yeah, you know, make a mistake, wash it away, and have clarity. Um, the ability to move on from things is is critical. I remember when we've started, you know, 
I'm, I'm really big on you're allowed to make mistakes. This game is imperfect. Make as many as you can or attempt to because then you're going to actually have a go at it. But I remember we were making mistakes at training and I'm, I'm watching guys do this and they miss a kick and they're doing push-ups. I said, what are you doing push-ups for? Go, go get the ball. <laughs> and, and they go, oh, no, but I made a mistake. I said, yeah, make a mistake. Go fix it. Like we're running around with the biggest arms in, in the competition at one stage. What are you doing here? Like, so, so changing behaviours around mistakes is okay was something that we had to set about. And then, and then it just evolves. And I, I, again, I use that analogy of one game. I think the bigger the games too, sorry, that, that the more you have to get away from yourself and then be able to move things. Like you have a set shot, miss. You've got to be able to go next minute on man in the mark. I'm getting on with it because that could come back in a hurry. And those – be able to execute. So um, windscreen wipers was used um, 2022 and in a big game too. It might have been an Anzac Day game then. It was like, hey, d- hey we'll make mistakes. Just quickly move it on. Yeah. So, and we've got we to be present. Stay in the moment. Be Live here because then you can go and lay a good tackle or yeah, win that ball back. But the, the Anzac Day game of this year, the one you're talking about with Braden, before the game I showed a Ted Lasso clip of um, Ted talking about the goldfish, the happiest animal in the world or something because – it has a 10 second memory and then <laughs> the gag to his, to his flyers was, you know, that, exactly that. Let some stuff go. So I said today, you know, we need to be goldfish. And I had it as a theme, boys today were goldfish. We let some stuff go because things won't go our way. Umpires decisions, you know, free kicks against whatever it looks like, missed goals, kicks out in the fall. What are, we will make some mistakes, but we're going to be goldfish. And we laughed at this clip and whatever. And then, Get to half time, and I think Jamie might have kicked a couple out in the fall at that stage. And I made a joke of it. So yeah. We talked about it before the game, you know, kick it out the fall. Yeah. Happened. Jamie, too many, mate, too many. And we're <laughs> laughing at that at half time. But then, literally, after um, half time, Bruzzy does that kick. It might have been one of the first minutes, and they get this kicks it the worst he's ever done. And I'm on the bench, and I looked at the bench, and I looked at the players, and I said, I suppose it's time to be goldfish, boys. <laughs> like, it was as bad as you get, isn't it? Like, that's a bigger clang you'll see. And, but I think that that's giving them permission, permission to fail and permission to have a go. Um, and I think, again, this group's really, really found their place with that. There's a skill in that though, Fly, I think that is underestimated, isn't it? And, you know, so you, even at, at junior sport where you might have the intention and you say to the kids, hey, we want you to take risks. And then the coach, when you do, goes, oh, fuck, you know, and, and puts his hands on his head. And mm. if you do that, you've probably lost it immediately, haven't you? Yeah. You're, you need that ability to. Yeah. To be able to keep the calm when it counts. Yeah, to no, it. I think it's, you know, you look at your own self a lot. And I, must, I self-reflect more than anything. And, you know, that's probably a strength of mine to be able to you know, not worry about the baby until September 30. Because yeah. I'm just going to do, you know, to the 29th well. Yeah, you know, worry about that. And so that's probably where I've lived my life a lot, um, which helps me sort of, I'm a process-driven guy. And I, and I keep educating our group. We're process-driven, not outcome-driven. So we live in the moment of, like, let's just do yeah, Tuesday well, and then Wednesday will come. So that that definitely helps you know, drive this stuff. The self reflection, fly picking up what you said earlier. So I, I, I'm cheeky. I'm not disrespectful, yeah. and you were known as that on the field and in our era. And uh, you know, every time you looked up, you were sort of the running the Mad Mondays at, yeah. at the Brisbane yeah. Lions. You know, famously. Do you think that was maybe this idea of a coach for you know a long time? Is the alphas the coach, and you've got to? We've probably selected that along the way. Do you think that maybe put you into the apprenticeship role for a bit longer because the world wasn't ready for that style? Yeah, potentially. Yeah, potentially. But also, um, I think I had a handbrake in myself um, in in that I wanted to not be in a hurry. Uh, I wanted to be a coach for, you yeah, know, life coach, whatever that meant, you know, for tenure. But um, I was determined to stay in the game for a long time. So I wasn't in a hurry to be assistant coach and then whatever the pathway was at that time. Um, yeah, I think, the, I think the, the coaching landscape's changed a lot. People change. People want to be more connected, more valued, more appreciated potentially. You know, you know, no, no one wants to be yelled at and told them that they're good anymore, that, but that was the style that we inherited and we lived by. Um, yeah, so uh, so yeah, maybe a little bit of a time for myself to find where I needed to go and, and grow and learn, and but also yeah, well, the way that young people like to be coached. Do you remember thinking about it as a player with you, you describe wanting a life tenure as a coach? Do you remember thinking... I'm going to do this really differently when you give me the chance. Uh, I, I'd never really had ambition to be a senior coach until probably 2019 when Adelaide came, rank, uh, they rang about their senior position and, and it caught me by surprise. I just 
part of Richmond's success and coached a VFL premiership in 2019. Literally two days later, the phone rings and we're really interested. And I wasn't then that I realised how close it was. Um, it wasn't just the right time for a family and, and just didn't feel ready for that, um, preparation wise to go for the job, but also in life. And then, um, yeah, that, that was probably a moment going, I'm close. And, and if the phone rings again, I'm going to be ready. And I went about for two, three years, putting together a bulletproof presentation, but also I knew my resume was going to be hard to fault for the next phone call that rang if it did ring. And I understand fly part of that resume when you presented to Collingwood, I read uh, recently that you presented it through the eyes of these great mentors of yours and, and you read the list. It's a sort of roll call of some of the most influential people in the history of the game. Uh, Choco Williams was your coach at Glenelg, had a huge impact. Robert Walls, your first senior coach at Brisbane and, you know, notoriously tough Woolsey. Mick Moldhouse, you went back to Collingwood, Nathan Buckley, in your time as an assistant at Collingwood, Damien Harwick at Richmond, Craig Bellamy, you were the kicking coach at the Melbourne Storm, Alistair Clarkson from Hawthorne, and then Lee Matthews as the triple premiership coach in that famous Brisbane era. Can you share with us the importance of that and what, and what you grabbed from them? Yeah, yeah. And it, um, yeah, that's what I thought that I had have a bulletproof presentation because when I'm putting this together for two or three years, I knew the extent of the people I'd worked with and the successes that those people had had and, and – my, you know, fingerprints somewhat of being involved in those programs, I knew what it was like to be a winner. And, um, for those that know me well, I'm, I'm not arrogant, but I know how to win. And that, and that was, that was the basis of my presentation. I'm a winner and I know how to win and I know the behaviors required to win because of all my experiences and, and, you know, the time at the Richmond footy club winning three flags in four years, the storm were doing something similar. And I was at the same, same, um, time frame. I was at two different organi- organizations, two different sports, but the same behaviors were there. The way that the training was unbelievable. And then the connection to the people and, you know, just discipline and leadership, it was all there. So I'm learning all these lessons and making, making mental notes and also coaching my own team at the time, trying to connect this stuff. Um, but, but ultimately if you look through all those, those names that I mentioned, I'd learned something off all of them, if not many off, off some and, you know, so I shared the the one or two things on a just a visual. You picture a visual of those guys, all the guys on a one page keynote, and I'm just telling stories about how they've influenced me to be in this position to go for this job. Yeah, it's uh, compelling when you when you set it out like that. We use the term a lot. Success leaves clues, doesn't there? Are patterns that you can pick up around successful people? Yeah. And you know, Craig well, Bellamy's history is enormous. You look right through that list. It's yeah, and all, and all of them had been. Premiership players, I'm pretty sure. I think I'm oh, close to it, and and uh, or or being attached it, to yeah. success everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. That, that, Every that, one of them actually. Yeah, yeah. And that that was, yeah, lucky enough in my playing career to to have some great um, mentors and learnings, and yeah. And then there was the, the the big one in the middle was Lee, who who taught me the most, of, probably because I was 28, ready for to you know on board a lot of stuff, and and then we had the success at the end of my career. I could see where it all fit. Yeah, amazing day, grand final day. Uh, got to spend a bit of time with Lee and just the fingerprints of him from 1990 in Collingwood and describe that as almost, uh, in his unemotional way, Lee, as the most profound uh, victory he had in his eight uh, premierships and then coach you in that extraordinary era. And you could see it was the, the, the proud father, wasn't he? When he put his arm around you, that must have been a beautiful moment. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And, um, yeah, I, I, I haven't had – a lot to do with Lee in recent time and um, the last couple of years, it, he rings me probably once a year, texts a couple of other times and, but then I got to share that moment on, on the ground. But then the next day we we had a reunion I got to chat to him even more and, um, yeah, I got a photo with Lee and it, it just it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me. Like this is like, I'm, I'm Lee's role player. And now I'm a coach of Collingwood who now we win the premiership. It's just quite surreal to be honest. Just jump on that for a moment. I mean, there's so many great images of grand final day and I, I want to come back to it again a little bit more, but was there one moment where you gave a hug to one person? Was it uh, Lee Matthews or one of the players? Was there one that you've got an image that you can go to or was it too many? Oh, there's a lot and, and a lot of it was a blur um, of just emotion and joy. Uh, you know, Darcy Moore, Moore seeing him yeah, embracing in a moment, yeah, I'll never forget. Um, yeah, just the staff too, you know, they do all the work and, you know, that, that joy to be able to share that moment and the excitement with those. And they're just, the, the surreal nature of, of winning premierships as a player, it felt the same as a coach. It's just 
can't believe it's happening. Is this real or what's hap- actually happening here? And so it's hard to describe it, but the, to be able to celebrate with people that you know have done so much work. And then there's the boot starter, Neil, who's been there way longer than any of us. Um, you know, before the game, he's a nervous wreck. And he goes, you just got to win this one. And I'm, I go, Neil, we got this, mate. We're, we're good. <laughs> and then to share in his joy afterwards and see what it means to a lot of people. And that's just staff. I know, I know, you know just outside how many people it means to the, the broader Collingwood community. So I don't lose, lose sight of that. He walked in here and uh, Joey is uh, a great editor of our podcast and he shared that, you know, he's in tears and been in tears many times. Uh, he's watched... quick to show me his tattoo, wasn't he? Yeah. His, his membership tattoo. <laughs> Mate, yeah. I almost had to call security to get him <laughs> off you there, fly for a minute, uh, Joey. He was, yeah. He'd never been more excited in his life than saying, can you come yeah. and uh, be here with uh, Fly today? Can you share the story? You just shared with me off air at the same time around picking up your mail. Yeah. Yeah, and, that, and that's and this is the thing you, you don't realise, and I, that's why I like to go home and have a red wine replay after the games every every win because you want to embed yourself in the game and see the people that are coming along and, and the emotion it, attached to it. So, yeah, I was just going to the mail to get the mail out on Monday or Tuesday this week, and um, a gentleman was walking his dog. He's an elderly, elderly gentleman. I'd never seen him before, but he's, he must live close, and he's um, got a premiership hat on and. I just suddenly said, oh, mate, I really like your hat. And he stopped and paused and looked at me, and then he just started crying. And I'm trying to make conversation with this man. This is a bumbling mess, but he's, he's you know, he just said, um, it, it, weeping, he goes, mate, you don't realise how much this means to all of us. And I, and, and you do, but you don't. Yeah. Like, how could I possibly know, you know, the, the Collingwood supporters and what they've been through or the family connected, the ones that missed out on it, that you know, didn't quite get there, whatever it looks like. Everyone's got a story to be told about it, but I don't lose sight of how important this is to so many people. It's the joyful part of sport, isn't it? I you know, can't imagine it's easily replicated in other areas of your life, isn't it, where people genuinely describe that day as the best day yeah. of their life. That's Joey did. Joey just did before. Yeah, he's he's nodding yeah, furiously yeah. out there, yeah. and, and I didn't have uh, – the, uh, the fortune or skill, you might argue, to, to win one as a player fly, but when the, our team won one after such a long time in 2016 as the Bulldogs, that is one of the best nights of my life, arguably the greatest. Yeah. All that old, it felt like all of the um, the skeletons and the frustrations were buried for all of us that did it, and we had this great catch-up with all the players from our era. And I, I can I still smile when I think about yeah. you know, being lucky enough to stand on the MCG that day. It's, it's unique, isn't it? It is, and then... You know, I, I didn't realise the scar tissue attached to so many Collingwood losses. I was very much aware of the uh, the narrative around Collingwood making grand finals and not winning them and losing close ones. But I, I didn't realise until grand final week how much people or people are still carrying all those scar tissues or stories from the Renee Kinks losing seven grand finals. And there, there, there's a lot of them. Um, Darcy Moore, um, Peter Moore's lost five grand finals. And so there's a lot of stories to be told. Um, and, and when we get the success that we had, the joy um, associated with that, but also allowing some cleansing and some healing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that too. So yeah, there's two sides of the story. Obviously, obviously to every, every grand final will be told, but um, yeah, this club has got an incredible history. Um, yeah, only 16 victories since 1892. That's, yeah, it shows how hard they had to win. And I think the stat from grand final days in 1967 and Collingwood have played in something like 16 grand finals and running one, two of them. So that is a lot of scar tissue, isn't it? Over is. yep. a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, th- hopefully this, this performance from our playing group in the club allows people to cleanse and heal and, and, but also creates a whole new journey of supporter base and, and joy. Well, as you know, to, to be a professional at any sport almost, particularly a collision sport like AFL, you, you're inherently a risk taker and you're going to make mistakes. You can't turn that off the second you get off the field and every club, every player, mate, we all made them. You deal with that in, a, in another unique way. I you know, saw the way that the, the whole world coming after one of your star players, Jordan Degali, over the journey that you've been coach and wanting blood from him and ban him for whatever reason. Um, and I think your line was – you know what, I just want to put my arms around and, and give them a hug. Yeah. Talk us through that approach. Oh, well, I'm, I'm a values-based leader. That, that, I think that's probably the best way to describe it, the way I go about it. And, um, you know, around love and support. And, you know, Geordie's a unique one in terms of, um, you know, the attention he gets for, for, for past errors, if you like. And, um, you know, I was only new to building a relationship with him. And I've, I've openly shared, and you've probably heard this before, that I, I don't have any sons, but I like to treat them like my own. And, but you don't always agree with what your 
you know, I've got daughters, but they don't always agree with the things they do. They make mistakes, they you know, stuff up or whatever. And, but you still ultimately at the end of the day love them and, and you're going to be there for them. So errors can be made, but you know, how do you react to that? You know, you know, and my style is, is, is values based, as I said. So I, I, I wanted to wrap my arms around Jordy and say, okay, yeah, I don't agree with what you've done here or, or you do agree, whatever, whatever happens. Yeah. And then you go, well, what are we going to do about it? Come on, I want to, I want to help you get through this. And, and so maybe that's something that Jordy hasn't received previously. I'm not sure you have to ask him. Um, but you know, to be there for him and, and, and being able to be in the same room was something that just straight away came to mind. I'm fascinated in real time though, uh, fine. You've, you've talked about this story, but it, you know, it's grandfather day. You got a bit going on, you got a baby being born, you're called in, you got two right shoes in your bag. So you got, <laughs> you got some solutions to. I was a left footer too. <laughs> right ones are no good to me. <laughs> and word comes through one of your players has gone to the races on a, yeah. on a, on the night before the grand final, Jack, you know, and how do you process that? Is there a, hey, I'm wrapping my arms around him or is there a bit of oh, shit? Not today, mate. Yeah, there's a, there's all all that, and I, but I, but again, I, there's certain things I just can't control. Does it does it affect us now? No, you know, let's let's give that some thought when I need to, but I don't need to worry about it now. Yeah. So I'd be able to put things where they need to be. Um, you know, I've, I'm openly say that I'm I'm on the fence whether that's the right thing to do. I, I'm probably erring in time to think it was a poor decision to be made. Um, yeah, you know, hence why I said read the room, Jack, in that situation. But it's, it look, I, I'm a, I'm about accountability, and I'm about rewarding behavior. Um, they're, they're things that I'm really big on and I won't walk through our hallways and see something that I like without calling it out. I won't, um, I won't allow somebody in our environment that does something that makes us better and not make sure that everyone appreciates that. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of things get done that people don't see. So I make sure they, they, they know who did that. Who, who puts the signs up in the, in the rooms before the game? We just walk in and assume it's just some magic click a finger gets done. I want to make sure we realize how many people do that. Who, who packs up afterwards? You know, we, we appreciate little, little, little things. And, um, so some of that is reward. And then the other part of this is about creating a culture where you go, well, we're winners. And I walked into this club and the first thing he said, oh, yeah, I'm a winner and I want to have winners and we're going to be winners. Winners only if you step in here. So that can, that can correlate in so many different angles. You know, are you a winner as, as a parent? Are you a winner as a dad? Are you a winner in the way you open the door for, for someone to into our environment or, you know, put your plate back on after you had lunch and don't just assume someone's going to clean it up. They're all winning behaviors. Yeah. Um, it varies. So for me, going to the races before the game, um, grand final day, that for me, that's not being a winner. So that's where I, I put that. And then you work around trying to educate or encourage or, or discourage behavior. Yeah. It's, uh, it sounds simple, but it's, it's profound. I think you, you, you touched on something there. I think it's really worth sharing is I think we miss the obvious a lot, which is that opportunity to say to someone, Hey, love what you're doing. Yep. It's fantastic. In all of our organizations, yep. the free hit is there. And, and particularly in Australia, you never see people more uncomfortable than someone telling them how well they're doing. Yeah. We find that really hard here yeah, in this is. country, don't we? Yeah, it is hard to, hard to receive good feedback. And, I, and I'm the same. I've learned over time that it's actually okay to be told you're doing something well, but I, I think ultimately we like to feel valued and appreciated. Um, there is a, the five languages of love. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the yeah, five languages. Yeah. One of them is affirmation. A lot of people like to be told they're doing well. They probably don't want to say it out loud, but a little pat on the back saying, mate, I really appreciate you doing that for us. But we, we're, we're our culture, we, we, once a week we get together to finish the week. We call it side by side. And and, and, and it's not every week, but I, most weeks it is this, that we just take a couple of minutes to say, okay, all right, I want to play it chat to the place, person next to you. I want you to look around the room and everyone's in the room, players and staff. I want you to look around the room and I want you, you to um, uh, give a shout out to someone that you would really appreciate that you've done, they've done something for you in the last couple of weeks. And then the staff look back at the players and tell the player that you really appreciate something they're doing, whatever. And it might only take five minutes in your environment, but it creates this pattern of behavior that it's actually okay to be told you're doing something well. And I'm going to look you in the eye, Dars, and tell you, I really appreciate that. So there's, it becomes comfortable because it can be uncomfortable to receive, you know, this some somewhat positive feedback with, um, that, oh, I don't know, I don't need that, I'm, I'm bulletproof, whatever. Um, as long as not we're polishing up stuff that's not real. Yeah. Because yeah, that's the difference. If you fluff up stuff that's not real, then people see through that straight yeah. away. Um, but when you're genuine and authentic, I think people can buy into that. Yeah, we do that in our in our leadership business in the team meeting. Start every meeting. What have you got to celebrate? What have you got yeah. to bring? And it becomes, 
Uh, and it is only five minutes, yeah. but you know, you've got to bring something positive to the table and it, it's a small bit of time, yeah. but it can be pretty profound. It is. Yeah. And it, every, we, I know my daughter and I and, and my wife, we sit around the dinner table every night and just make sure we say what we're grateful for. Yeah. Cause it, it, it makes you appreciate what you've got. Cause yeah, this is a crazy world we're living in in it. So, um. Yeah, and I love the opportunity to share great leadership stories and I appreciate you doing it today because your empathy and your care and your authenticity, you know, really uh, comes out in everything that you do. But we know in a lot of environments that old style of leadership is still there and you've got the boss who's got the hierarchy and it's command and control and it's still that I'm going to yell at you to do what I need you to do. What would you say to people listening that, and maybe, um, you know, in that sort of position of power or what does good leadership look like to you? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, is it essential or, or, or a, a given? I, I don't know, but I, I live in an open-minded mindset. So I'm open-minded to things. You come up with an idea, I'm open-minded. Where's that fit? Let's see if that can make us better. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. No way in hell would I consider myself to be perfect. So I'm open to criticism or, you know, yeah, this is not good enough. Yeah, I get that, mate. Oh, I, remember, I remember going to a board meeting. We lost three games in a row. And there was a, a conversation around, this This better not continue. This is not good enough. And I, I, I can't control what others say, but I say, hey, let, let's come back. I'm a process guy. I'm going to show you how we're going to fix this. Yeah. So, yeah, but there's, you know, taking people on the journey, building relationships. Jeff Brown and I, I would ring Jeff Brown every Thursday after match committee and just tell him what we're doing with the team and why. And I heard Lee did this as a, as a coach to... Um, you know, when he was at Collingwood and I thought, that's a great idea. I don't really know Jeff Brown. No idea. I'd hardly met him. Um, and so I thought, well, this is a chance to build a relationship. He'll, he'll get to know my style. I'll get to know his. And then we can work together and, and, and build trust because that's ultimately, once you've got a relationship, you can yell at me as much as you like, Jeff. You know, I, sometimes I might laugh at it <laughs> because we've got such a relation. Oh, whatever, Jeff. Yeah, we've got this. Or other times going, no, no, you're right, mate. You, that's that's well grounded. Yeah. But without a relationship, it, it's it's difficult to get that feedback and like without getting your front up. Um, so ultimately, you know, how you connect with people is and build relationship is, is critical, isn't it? Yeah. Jeff Brown, the, the president of, of your club, it's a really smart thing, isn't it? We asked you about communication in a while, isn't it? But that just it's five minutes of your week yeah. can save a lot of, uh, a yep. lot of pain uh, in the future. Fly, we're really privileged to uh, have you part of our leader connect program and, where we bring together leaders from different non-competing backgrounds in a diverse range of uh, areas. Yours are a really uh, fascinating group. I know they're private conversations, but I love uh, hearing the stories. Can you tell us about this experience and, yeah. and what it's meant to you? Oh, it, it, you know, I've just started out my journey as a senior coach and then walk in and they've got Andrew McDonald, then he becomes the Australian cricket coach and, and Seabs was um, over with the UK Rugby Union and then obviously now it's back with uh, with Manly and and then got John, John Elwissi. They won the flag that year. They won the pr pr premiership um, the first year we did it. And and Mike was with the Milwaukee. They were in the well, they were the NBA playoffs. They win it. They won they? it in twenty twenty one. Yeah, so they might have just won it and then coming in. So there was all this success around there too. So you're listening to stories and the, like you said, the fingerprints and the you know the, the breadcrumbs of what makes success. And I, I I constantly get something out of these these um, you know Zoom calls and catch ups and. There's so many subtle little things from, you know, how we, we picked our leadership team this year. We had to revolve our leadership team. And I asked a question just before Christmas, any experiences from the group? You know, and uh, Andrew McDonald shared the story around how they they went from, you know, their new captain and testing one day as in, um, in Cummings and the process of that and the regrets he had and didn't didn't do. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to take everyone on a journey. So I, I, I set about doing it exactly what Andrew didn't do, you know, because he said that I would do this differently. And so all those things... Um, there's little things that you're getting out consistently and, um, yeah, from, cause we're all living the same stuff, aren't we? But yeah. it's just, you know, a different code or a different environment, but I, I've got a lot of it. Matt, uh, who, uh, the founder, a leader and a great friend of mine, uh, said he, he was just uh, blown away by one of the first meetings and getting that group together. You imagine everyone's on different time zones and there's a fair bit of skill in, bringing together that group of busy people and it coincided with a training session and, you, you know, new coach, happy to, to leave the track and, and, and spend some time on your own personal development. A lot of coaches wouldn't be comfortable in their own skin to do that, but you could do that, you know, in one of your first experiences. How did you come to that? Yeah, that's, it's, it's always difficult because you you especially knew I was trying to drive the bus and say, no, this is where we're going. And then, um, and then, you know, 
be, be prepared to then sit at the back because the bus is going pretty good. And, um, so it, it did challenge my thought process around it, but, but if I'm going to say to our group consistently, nearly daily, Hey boys, we're getting better every day. Now today's another, no exception. We're getting better. Make yourself better. If you train this, whatever it looks like. And I'm, I'm not role modeling that. Well then I'm, you know, my word's not nowhere near as much meaning, does it? So, I, so I, you know, I'm prepared to step out and tell my coach, hey, look, I'm doing this thing. I'm going to get better. So I, I walk out of that meeting thinking I've missed something, but actually, in fact, I've gained. So I went out in the track with full of energy and a couple of little ideas. And But, but I, it, it, you know, every, every situation is slightly different. But in that, in that particular moment, only, you know, I'd have been only a month or two into my tenure as a Collingwood coach, I thought, oh, this is a chance to actually do the opposite. Trust the people I've got around me because yeah. I've got great staff. So that's, a, that's an example of, like, I don't need to be – you know, holding the whip and whipping it all the time. I've got trust that the right people are doing it and delegate. And then two, I'm getting better. It's a great message to the team around you for me, is and I'm empowering you. You, we've got great people. I trust you. I can let go. That that is yeah. a unique thing to get early on, and it, it's it's really powerful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I know Jeff Brown says the same. You know, employ the right people to let them do their job. And I, I think I'm in an interesting conundrum a little bit at the moment because I'm going to go to. To uh, Boston in December and do a Harvard leadership course, which is um, yeah, which I'm really excited for. But it coincides that first week back for training, and the first week back in this campaign, I want to make sure we get the right messaging going early. Yeah. So I feel a bit compromised on it, but I might I might zoom myself in because because yeah. if I've again if I'm saying to our playing group, hey, we're getting better, and we're not there's no ceiling on this. There's no we're an open mind. There's no why can't we just grow through the roof? And I'm in Boston doing a seven day leadership course. I think that could send the right message too. Hey, yeah, we might've had success, but we're not standing still here, but I've got to get the balance of that right. If you're not yeah. there, um, yeah. Well, what message does that send? I love your thought process though, isn't it? Technology allows you to, to, to do, do both, uh, potentially. I, I'm told that your grand final weekend is, is just extraordinary, isn't it? Baby born 7.45, you win the grand final. Told the next morning, one of your Elite Connect sessions on, you pop up with baby oh, yeah. Maggie sitting inside the cup. Uh, yeah. uh, you squeeze a premiership reunion in yeah. with uh, your great Brisbane Lions uh, teammates. Uh, There's many lies to that though, Darcy. Like, yeah, you know, I, I often say that I'm. it's a moment in time that I'll be the Collingwood coach, but I'm going to be a father forever. Yeah. So I want to be there for my kids and I want to be there for my wife. And then, but then also I'm not the Colling Collingwood coach without my time at Brisbane. So there was a reunion on on the Sunday, and I, I'm it's in I'm going. I'm and it might only be for one beer, but I'm there just to show my respect for you know this opportunity they've given me. You know, like I'm not here without it, so I never forget where I come from. And and then the elitist stuff's the same. Like a um, I've just we just got out of hospital, so I was an hour late. But but I thought, oh, can I get on here? And I've got the little one in my hand, and you know, <laughs> I, I actually think I might even cried. I was probably because I had no sleep, but also the emotion of it all. But again, I. Yeah, you just appreciate what you got and, and you know, don't forget the people along the way that have helped you have success because you know, quite often you meet them on the way down if you you go up to it and, and don't forget those people. Yeah, you you mentioned your values. You you, you show them. You, you turn up and show them in every minute. Five minutes to go, grand final day. I felt like sitting there, you had the better of the day all the way through. Brisbane hit the front. You're back into a centre bounce. I mean, how did you how did you assess that moment and what was going through your mind? Yeah, I think that five minutes I've watched about ten times um, back on replay, and yeah, you, know, you, you you train all year habits and behaviours for when you need them most. And grand final day is the time where you need the the great habits you've created, whether it's training standards or you know game plan education and you know set plays, whatever it looks like. We, we've we've trained habits around our close wins and close losses or kill the game, win the game scenarios a lot. And so when that happens, yeah, you know, the, 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 the staying in the moment, the goldfish, the windscreen wiper, can't do anything about it. What's next? Here we go. Right here we right away, get the sign up. We're going to this mode. And then the on-field leadership to, to execute and go, we're all on the same page. We've, we've trained that for two years. Yeah. Train the situation, look after others and then well, get yourself right. You know, those things are all there trained and, and, and readied for when you need them. And, Sign goes up, ball goes up, and and then you just have some c complete and utter skill and class and talent that executes Dacos handball to Geordie to go and kick across your body from fifty. You can't train that stuff. <laughs> that's that, that's that's 
that's one at the draft. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, those, those um, unbelievable talent able to shine above, you know, game plans and shine above moments and yeah, manage those moments, you win the premiership. Can you compare standing there as a as a coach of a premiership side to the to the three as a player? Is is it yep. is it different? Is it more special? Or how do you how do you yep. describe it? Yeah, Lee, Lee Lee said that out in the field. He says, "Oh, you you remember this a lot more as a, than you did as a player." And, and at the time, you're just in it. But I, it's absolutely true because as Joey's out here with his tattoo still wet, <laughs> and and that man that walked past my house crying with his dog and. 106,000 members and, you know, you, you, as a coach, you're, you represent all those. You're the, you're, the, you're the figure for those. And I know our staff do all the work. I'm yeah. not trying yeah. to say I do all the work. But um, you realise that you are driving a lot more emotion when you've got your own medal, you know, you and your team. Yeah, you, know, you do represent your fans and the like, but certainly as a coach, it, you, you represent a lot more people. Well, in the uh, space that we're really passionate about, the elite earners, as I said, we're incredibly grateful to connect with you and that success does leaves clues. And we see these common traits we think that great leaders show and, and always start with an idea of self-leadership. It's hard, we think, to lead anyone else if you haven't got an idea of your own self-leadership. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I've spent a lifetime becoming this guy and, um, and I'm not finished. So, yeah, there's a lot of Self-reflection, a lot of mistakes made, um, courses done. You know, I'm 50 now and, you know, I, I think one of my great strengths is my self-awareness, my emotional intelligence. Um, I can read a room well. That's why I wouldn't go to the races the day before. <laughs> see, that's my cheeky discovery. See, see the cheekiness? Yeah, I that's love it. it. <laughs> but, but I, yeah, that emotional intelligence and being able to read body language and listen for clues from what players need or staff need and quite often people say don't say things that they really want to say you can hear it in their thing so all that stuff i think is important but it's a it's a lifetime to get here um yeah and a lot of lessons learned along the way the great line that i've spent a lifetime being this guy and it's not ending you know, it's that constant never-ending self-improvement we see is another real pattern of, of people they're curious always yeah. uh, and continue yeah. to to follow that we, we talk about Leaders really conscious now, fly more than ever, about the impact they have on others on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm curious of the answer here because I think that's something you're particularly good at, that positive impact daily. How, how have you thought about that? Um, in what context? Just the idea now around when I walk into a room, when I walk into any environment, what's yeah. the positive thing I'm doing yeah. a, a, around the people I'm at in any in any scenario you're in? Yeah, I think I think that's a natural course of my own energy. Um I don't find it that difficult to see a glass full um, or close to it, um, see the good in people. So I think that's important. And, and, and obviously with tiredness and being pulled, your focus gets pulled in all sorts of directions through performance and the role. But you know, coming back to what you're good at, and um, you know, I remember we lost three games in a row that time when I had to go to that board meeting. And, and it was only my first year as a coach, and there's a lot of different – pressures that come with that that you haven't experienced before and I don't know it'll come again but then you know sitting in a coma for two days in my bed going what how do I get out of this you know like what do we do and you know playing a Friday night and finally get myself into a energy level just to communicate with my wife let alone anyone else and she goes she goes you know how to do this you know how to get out of this I said what she goes just be you it's a positive version of you so instead of looking at all the things we didn't do in that game or the yeah. last two weeks I scrapped it and just said to the coaches that day, I said, boys, don't come tomorrow and show us what we didn't do. I don't, I'm not interested. Find evidence of all the things that we have done and what we're going to do next. Like, let's concentrate on the team we want to be, not the team we are right now. So, and it, funnily enough, it was, it was a great reset of like, we might have tried to go too fast, too quick with the group when you go, no, they got that, they got that, let's go to this. Yeah. So we just went back in time and a little bit and said, boys, if we're going to be this great pressure team, we're going to do this. Yeah. So funny enough, we won the next 10 games in a row, I think from that, but it was, it was a moment that the group was potentially waiting for, you know, that, that heavy stick and not to say that you can't, you, you can't give a heavy stick, but, but at that time they probably got what they'd least expected. And it was a moment to go, all right, no, you, we need to be this team. Let's go be this team. So that 80, 20 rule, if you like, yeah. of positivity or reward behavior. Um, and then the 20% of like, Hey, let's get better in this area. Yeah. Creating and sharing a vision is something we see 
a really common trait for, for great leaders and they're really clear on how they share that vision. How have you gone about that? The great thing about going for this position was there was an extensive three-month exercise of presenting five or six times. And one of the questions was, um, what's your first three months look like? So I only reflected on it um, about two or three weeks ago because one of my close friends was going for another position at the club. And he said, so I went back in time and had a look at it. And, and there, there was the vision, the cultural vision around who we want to be and the pillars of you know, family first and connect with our past and, and take the fans on the journey. It's all there. And so to now to know it's two years later that we've lived that, it makes me really warm inside. I'm going, oh, wow, this is great. You know, this, you know, water what you want to grow mentality of reward the behavior. It's all there. Um, so, and, and quite often you have a vision. And I think the best thing that I've experienced in two years is get people around you that are, you share the vision with and, and, and encourage or, you know, um, manipulate if you like, or, or, or get them to come on the same journey with you. Or they can then take this to places you'd not never thought would be possible. Yeah. And and so we've got great staff that have, you know, not only you know, Jared Wade had high performance, he's gone to another level and I'm, I'm got this vision and then it's just so far beyond what I thought would be capable. That that's that's exciting to start something and and then watch it grow if you like. I love you. You mentioned family first and I, I can't not acknowledge because we see it in the industry you know, Bo McCreary's mum delivers yeah. a pre-game speech, yeah, yeah. which is just, I mean, it's so funny and it's so brilliant at the same time, but it's not, you know, people have these values documents and they sit in the top drawer and no one really knows them, but you brought that to life. Every time I look down the rooms, the, the whole family yep. are there and they're lining alongside the banner. You, yeah. You've lived it, haven't you? We have. And, 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 and I praise the partners, parents and, and others that step into this. It's a choice. It's a choice. Connection is a choice. Um, and the post COVID, I've openly said, it was a, a massive ripple for all of us in the footy world and life that we're disconnected from all the things that we wanted. To. We want we're humans. We want interaction. And so that we set about family first, and then you know getting you know school holidays, kids in to run the water, and then after games and all you know just all the different layers of it. Mother's Day, all the mums come into the team meeting, and Father's Day we did the same. And, and there was an opportunity Mother's Day to have Julie McCreary come in and, and in line with that, keep the meeting light to start the meeting. It was just a perfect fit. And uh, little did I know that was going to, she went viral, didn't she? It was a, it was a great moment. How, how did the call go when you rang Julie McCreary and said, uh, do you want to do the pregame speech? How did that go? Well, it, it was all set up the day before. Yeah. So we had my pregame meeting. Um, this is how we're going to win the game and what we need. Had mum, son, mum, son all the way, the way around the room. And they got to listen to the... They were part of the whole meeting. Fantastic. And yeah. so, so we go, oh, you know, Donna Maynard, oh, Donna, what do you think here? And she says something funny and the boys laugh because it's like, <laughs> I think he, I think Ruzzy introduced Donna as his, um, yeah, full-time, full-time nuffy. Like, like, <laughs> my mum likes this. And so the laugh and I asked Jane, um, my check, you know, had, Brody kicked five the week before. How did you feel about it? Oh, about effing time. You know, like, <laughs> so just, just again, it, you know, I thought it was one of the better meetings that we had to set up a game because you got... This genuine, um, I didn't realize how attentive the players are with their mums are listening. Yeah, you know, they're, they're in. You yeah. look at everyone's eyes, they're in. So you don't, you feel like everything you're saying is just becoming truly in, embedded in, in what we're trying to achieve. Again, set the yeah. people up well. So then match day, you feel a comfort. We've got trust. We've done the work, boys. Just go play. And what a life memory for the mums, uh, Fly. Yeah. It's often, you know, look back and I think of my own mum, it was often so much about the dads and the father-son and, and, and the mums play yep. an overwhelming uh, role in all of our lives, but probably don't get, you know, that, that'll stay with them forever, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, the, the, they all came in the meeting room before and photos and that's, it's, again, it's, you know, you want to be a family first. What does it look like? Well, that's what it looks like, that we, we care about our mums and, I still think we're scratching the surface of what we're capable of or got some other ideas how we make that even deeper. But, you know, um, Bruce Pendlebury came to the Father's Day one last year and he openly said his son's 17th year at that stage, that was one of the most memorable times of his life. Yeah. Like uh, for, for Scott's time at the, at the, at the footy club because he was part of the team meeting and he's part of the goal king comp against Peter Dacos and just, but it just gave a sense of we're all in this because we changed our, our, our mode, if you like, early last year. We travel and partners and you can come. Maybe it's old school that you couldn't, and now you can come. Bring your kids, whatever. We lost a brilliant final by a point. Tears in the room. 
there's kids running around. Jack Chris kids running around. Um, you know, wives and partners are there right there when you're lost. When you need your family the most, because yeah. when things happen really well, you go to your family. When things don't, I need my wife. I need yeah. my. I need someone to console in it or to reconcile with that. Um, so family right there when you need it. So to keep the family coming with us, to enjoy the success of what we just had on September 30, it it's, makes it really special. But then if we didn't, they're right there for you too. So then you don't have to fall as far. So I think um, certainly the club we want to continue to be. It's brilliant. Curiosity is a word that we see a lot of. And through curiosity, we see uh, leaders like you constantly learning and, and improving themselves through curiosity. Does that resonate? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. And hence the leader, you know, once a month, you always find something new or you know, there's always something little to improve yourself. Um, yeah, I'm not a massive reader in terms of, um, you know, novels or biographies or things like that, but I'd, I'd love to listen to podcasts. Um, you know, just constantly just trigger the mind. When you get old, as you know, it does. There's a lot in there. Sometimes <laughs> you just need something to bring it back to the front, isn't there? Yeah. So you get lost in there. Communicating with clarity is another dimension I want to ask you about, and, and you do that in, in your own unique way. Have you, have you thought about the way you communicate as a leader of your club? Yes. Yes. Um, I think one of the big things I'm conscious of is whatever comes out of my mouth, I've got to live. Um, don't say things you can't action. And, you know, like, for example, Billy Frampton, I'd, I'd said to him a couple of weeks before the grand final, I think, mate, I really want to give you an opportunity. I'm not sure if he's going to be there, but I wanted to give hope. But don't give that hope unless you can fulfill it. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I did a course in London 2021, I think it might have been, or not 20, roughly. Um, and it was around um, Gravitas. Yeah, because like you said, I'm not the alpha male. If I'm going to be a senior coach, I've got to have gravitas. I've got to have presence. And it taught me a lot about you better to be in someone else's shoes when you present. And then what do the audience want to hear now? Um, who, where have they come from? Have they come from, you know, they just woke up in the morning at 7 o'clock. Do I need to wake them up? Now, all these little things that you learn when presenting. But now being the face of the footy club, which I had never been before or didn't really love the media, to be honest. It's not not that I didn't love them, but I didn't love the attention of it all. Um, but again, I think it's just about being yourself, really, ultimately. Curious about doing a course on on gravitas and presence. So you recognise within yourself, you wanted to 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 add some layers to to yeah. that. And yep. can you give some more detail on that? Did it help? Did it- yeah, it did help. It helped a lot. Um, yeah, little did I know, I already had a lot of it, yeah. and it just made me need to believe in myself a bit more. Um, yeah, the self-awareness is a big attachment to Gravitas. Um, yeah, you know, authentic leadership is something that, you know, being yourself, but also, yeah, you know, the, 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 the body language, the, you know, your tones, um, you know, leave, leaving little bits of yourself spread around the room without even knowing it, like you're just saying less when more seems to be needed. You know, I'm not saying anything here. Silence can be really powerful. So all these little things... Um, yeah, well, the way you present, and yeah, you know, I do love presenting. I'm a teacher, so that's one thing that I do. I see it as, as theatre, if you like. Yeah, you know, like it's a here's a performance. I like you know, a presentation is a performance. But I, I every conversation, sorry, every presentation I ever do, and I tell this to our coaches, make it a conversation. Don't make it a presentation. So then, if you're having a conversation like we are now, mm. it's different to a presentation. Um, so then we we set that up a certain way. Yeah, and I think you're 100% on the money that so many of us fall down because we're trying to be what we think great leadership looks like and we're trying to be a version of someone else that we think and that's always going to fall short, isn't it? The only option is to be ourselves yep. and the best version of ourselves because people pick up in a second, don't yeah. they, if, you, yep. if you're not. And that's you, everything about you is authentically Craig McRae and that's got as much gravitas as, as anyone has. Well, yeah, it's my style and I... I yeah, I, I drive past Collingwood, still do, and going, oh, God, I can't believe we coached that club. And, you know, the photo with Lee's is a great example of what? What? We both coached Collingwood premierships? Gives a spell. This, that's not real. So there's a, there's a, there's a real, um, I have good perspective on it, but also I'm a, um, yeah, I don't lose sight of how lucky I am to be doing this job and um, it won't be forever, but, you know, I want to be the certain person while I'm doing it and it's going to be challenged and tested and in all sorts of levels and, at some stage, I'll shake hands and move on, and hopefully, there's still a little authentic version of myself. 
no doubt in my mind at all that whenever that day comes, uh, that won't be a question that needs to be asked. How important has collaboration been for you, Fly? Yeah, I'm, I, I think I used to always approach things with, uh, with a, a group mindset. Okay, let's get together as a group and work through it. Over time, I've learned that that can be of benefit, but also it can be um, very time consuming. So there's certain levels of collaboration that uh, I approach things with now, um, probably less than I once did. Um, yeah, I don't mind saying, no, this is the way we're doing it. And then onboard people. Yeah, you know, I, I know we started our DNA stuff and I said, no, this, what do you, I contact the leadership group and said, this is my idea. And, and, and onboarded my idea as opposed to saying, this is how we're going to do it. As opposed to, oh, let's get them in a room for two hours and then let's, let's talk about how we want to play. We did that. We did that for the game plan. But certain levels of it, I'm going, no, this is how we're doing it. Yeah. And then it's about how we're onboarding those people. So I think I've changed a lot in the last, you know, three or four years around collaboration versus like, sometimes you're just going to make a strong decision and make people believe in it. Yeah, it's smart, isn't it? That understanding, isn't it? You're employed to do that and you need to collaborate. You need to bring people on board. But, you know, if, yep. you, if you go consensus on everything, yep. you're not going to get a lockdown all the time. No, and, yeah. and I think in two years of Graham Wright in particular, I've worked heavily with him. I'm, I'm more right now in the case of take people on the journey. Yep. So, yeah, this is, this is why we're doing it. And as opposed to what do you all think about it? Like just bring everyone on the journey. We're making this decision, but take everyone on the journey to make that decision. Understand why this is why we're doing it. So that that's from draft picks to, to leadership decision making to changing schedules, whatever it looks like, mm. take them on the journey. Go make sure they understand why we're doing this as opposed to this element of surprise and so I think, hence, even with the fans, you know, this is what we want to play. Take yeah. them on the journey. Explain why we're doing this um, as best you can. Yeah, brilliant. Fly, I've asked these two questions of everyone. I've had uh, the great privilege of sitting down with and I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed doing that with you today. Who's been the greatest leader in your life? Uh, many, many. I'd say my dad. My dad would be number one um, for many reasons. Work ethic. He's always got – you don't realise when you get older that – how old your dad is, but <laughs> he starts, says some things, but he's, he's definitely, he's got more of a fixed mindset than me. Yeah. He's a bit set in his ways, but he's 73, but he's been incredible. He's always been there from the journey, picking me up when I needed to be, pushing me where, where I needed to go. And, um, Tell us a bit more about him. Fly. What, what uh, did he bo- do? For- yeah. Boiler maker for yeah. 45 years, worked six days a week. Um, had to earn everything, got in life. Yeah. We, we end up, mum and dad split up. We ended up living in the caravan park together and, through some tough times in 16, 18, 19, whatever it looks like before I got drafted. Um, yeah, like he's, he's, a, he's a man of great integrity, great hard work. Um, yeah, was there for me. How much joy did he get out of Grand Final? Yeah, he's still crying and he, he's, I don't think I've ever heard him cry. Well, so I've never seen him cry. Um, he, he texted me three days in a row. He cried three days in a row from the birth of the baby to premiership win and then to do all the other parts of it. So, um, yeah, it's pretty special to be able to, for him to still be alive. He, he almost lost his life last year, so it is pretty special. Um, and then, then there's so many different layers of leadership. My, yeah, obviously Lee, Lee Matthews is the, probably the one that comes to mind the most. Um, yeah, just around, you know, football and lessons and all those things. But um, I'm not going to lose sight of myself around leadership because I, made a lot of mistakes in so many different areas and yeah, the resilience to change my own tack and stick to who I want to be and re, you know, revisit those things over and over again. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah, at one stage I'll sit back fishing somewhere and be proud of the journey we've been on. Yeah. I love the reflection and the self-awareness that keeps coming back and, um, yeah, I haven't had anyone ever answer it with that final thought at the end, but it's profound and, yeah, in a lot of ways, that's that's where it starts and ends, isn't it? With our own ability to shift paradigm, which you've been able to do. We're obsessed at a leader with this idea of what collaboration looks like and the idea of um, learning from each other and how do we we do that on um, you know a small scale and a, a global scale as well. So the question to me, if, if you collaborate with anyone on anything fly, and you might have another passion, another area of your life, is there someone you thought, God, I'd love to yeah. collaborate with that person? Someone oh. that springs to mind? John Bertram, I, f- I formed a relationship with John. We were just walking the tent. We were f- literally the first day that I started this role. 
took all the staff for a walk around the town, grab a coffee, just to have an informal connection. John Bertram's standing at the lights. And I knew John um, was a Collingwood, whether well, it was a director or it was definitely involved way back when um, when Mick was involved. And I saw him in, growing up as a kid in, you know, in Adelaide. Mary's Cup's huge. Like he's one of the most famous Australians in the world. Do you remember that morning? Uh, I, I do vaguely. Yeah. Vaguely, uh, Bob Hawke's words and, you know, waking up to this victory. I didn't know much about it, but. We were the same age. I yeah, remember my yeah. dad got me out of bed and right. uh, really you, you got to understand this. And I remember, you know, I shared this with John. I thought, this is the most boring thing I've ever seen <laughs> a boat race. What's happening here? Where is it? <laughs> Didn't quite understand the gravitas, nah. but sorry to interrupt, but yeah. John's been a, a, a big mentor and a big collaborator. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I formed a, an initial introduction at that, uh, at that lights and and he walked down a little bit. I said, I'd love to catch up with you a bit more. Like, do you mind if we walk to town? Because he lives there. And within a week, I'm walking to town with John and just listening. And it, just the stories, his involvement with the Olympic team and swim team and, you know, the stuff he's doing now, his passion. And, and that and that stayed true. And I've caught up with him again at the end of that year. And then we've gone out to dinner, my wife and I and his wife. And there's just, there's just this man crush on this guy because it's just <laughs> someone that continues to to look to be better and mentor and yeah, what, what, what an incredible human being. He's incredible, isn't he? 75 years of age, still racing and the great privilege of overlapping with him in the elite space. And he drops yeah. into a room and what he always says, I know absolutely nothing. And he starts every conversation with, and he just fires questions, doesn't he? Yeah, He's he just does. constantly yep. being and, curious. Yeah. And he, yeah, what's the game going to look like in five years? He, he says that to me all the time. Yeah, you know, we, I think we were last in in centre bounces in two thousand and twenty two, and they've just come into the final series. And I said, "Oh mate, we've got some issues around our centre bounce and stuff." He goes, "Well, what's it going to look like in five years' time? Don't try to fix it now." I said, "Oh God, I just want to get tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> but it's just constantly about that, you know, that that improvement and that I you know, think beyond what others are doing you know, around the AI space and and yeah, you know, why, why wouldn't you be ahead of the game? And yeah, you know, to have someone like that, just a text message away or. Yeah, you know, a walk of the town away is it's pretty, it's pretty cool. If you uh, haven't seen the documentary on Netflix, which tells the story of John Bertrand's America's Cup win and his team and the detail on the links and being 10 years ahead, I encourage you. It's one of the great documentaries. Even if you have no interest at all in, in sport, you'll learn something from John Bertrand. Like I've learned today, uh, fly, sit down and uh, marvel at what you've been able to do. The authentic uh, leadership's a, a great story. And congratulations. You deserve all your success and look forward to watching what comes next. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Us. Appreciate it.